or 19. So, oh wow. The presenters are going to be here in person today. Okay. So I think we're just waiting. We're just waiting for them. It wasn't weird enough coming in for a meeting. <laughs> we have to see real people too. <laughs> It's been a long time. Emma, my butler says hi. Oh, really? Are you working with him? He came into the office today for a visit. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Is he still like? I mean, the last project I worked on him with him was uh, no cost. He said so, that's the last that's thing. He's got like okay, one inspection okay, yeah. in the spring, he said, and then yeah. he's formally and retired. He's done. Yeah. 82 years yeah. old. Uh, 82. And then you will want oh. to believe that. Yeah. He'll find his way. <laughs> 82. Uh, he's such a gem. He's such a gem. Oh, yeah. what a guy. Yeah. yeah. Is he, but he's, uh, he's out in BC, right? Well, wasn't, is, doesn't he have a place out in BC? He does in Vancouver, yeah. yeah. I thought he was spending a lot of his time there. Last time I was chatting. Yeah. 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 Oh, he was on the yeah. registration committee for quite a while there. So, yeah, I found out. I think it was probably okay. a year ago. That was the last time I saw him. Yeah, it stays busy with the streaming again and oh. just waiting for. Oh, yeah, thanks for doing that. Now, is anyone. Is anyone going to be attending virtually for the um, yes, side? the other half of their team. Is okay, the be better virtual. half. <laughs> They're just sending sending the vanas here to do these. <laughs> so, did you get to? Uh, Go out and play any hockey there, Kevin? With those uh, yeah. Friday? Yeah, I went to two of them. I think. Oh, okay. They were a little quick for my. Well, I made. I'm now. I've got a, an MCL problem. I made the stupid decision to join the younger crowd and yeah. go to this tournament in Edson on. Uh, oh, sure. Come on in. Oh, uh, sit here. You know, St. Patrick's Day weekend. Oh, okay, yeah. So I got there, I found out like it was like a one. So I, I held my own, but um, oh my God. So fast. So, and I, as I said, I ended up wrecking my knee. Hello, sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Okay, we just haven't got a call or, or anything yet to join or if it's going to be delayed. So just wondering how we're doing for time and start. This is it. <laughs> You're on it. You, okay, yeah, usually, sorry, it was said don't join until you get a call or email saying please join. So just wanted to make sure that we could get all the, the team here. Yeah, uh, that, that's my fault. So, uh, yeah, just let them know whoever is online to join, please. Sounds good. Thank you. Yeah. Well, you first chair ever. Can't be perfect all the time. <laughs> <laughs> perfect. No worries. I was panicked. I'm like, it says not to join until called, but what if they forgot? So I gambled. <laughs> we will never forget about you. <laughs> oh, uh, that is yet to be determined. <laughs> Okay, everyone else should be joining right away then. Thank you. So before we do, um, when do we ask for conflicts of interest? I guess that's done in advance, right? So uh, we generally we, don't ask. Uh, yeah, so we don't. It's we typically don't the any. responsibility of a committee member to, to acknowledge. Prior, prior, like, yeah. Yeah. Let's double check. Am I a concrete company or something? Yeah, do you have a side, uh, you have a side hustle we don't know about? <laughs> yeah. I really like to see a lot more concrete in this job. You know, like, yeah, it's, it's pretty <laughs> as an uh, integrated site uh, specialist. <laughs> 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 
Yeah, the university guy. Why you got a side hustle? <laughs> yeah, like, okay, I first started. Well, yeah, but I work at the university. There's no yeah. conflict. <laughs> like our first meeting, there was the uh, uh, property trust. Yeah, trust. <laughs> right now, I am. As I'm looking over my script, and it was like that to acknowledge one conflict. Yeah. <laughs> what point do we check for conflicts? Oh, everyone stopped talking very suddenly when Mark joined. <laughs> <laughs> Or was it Devin who had that effect? It was a cooler. I'll take that as a compliment. <laughs> and a wave to my beautiful painting. <laughs> okay, full disclosure, I'm at my in-laws' house. Yeah. <laughs> I was gonna say, I thought you were in a holiday inn in Kamloops or something like that. <laughs> Mark's taste is a little bit more avant-garde, but I quite like the background. It's quite it's nice. That's good where he was so far, actually. Uh it beauty. meets my blind white wall. So, <laughs> okay. I guess just let us know when the, is everyone here. Uh, yeah. So from the design team, uh, it is Devin. Do you know if is Mel joining? No, Mel is unable to join us. Okay. Uh, and then I can't see everybody in the room, but I believe I heard Ian. Yeah. 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 I'm here. I think from the city, we're we're good. So okay. Is, is Carl away. there? No, uh, no, he'll be joining online uh, when he can. Okay, if he can. Yeah. Great. Uh, other than that, are there any formalities or anything we want to jump into? No, I'll just uh, crack on. So, okay. hello, welcome to the Edmonton Design Committee for the formal development permit presentation of the Ambleside Integrated Site. Is that the name of it again? <laughs> Good enough. Uh, thank you so much for being here. We would like to remind you that this is a public meeting. We have all received and reviewed your submission package. Your team will have 10 minutes to present, and then we will go do a roundtable of committee members for questions. After the presentation, the committee will deliberate and respond to you in writing within 48 hours. On that note, I'll pass it on to the team. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, if you don't mind, I'll share my screen so that you can see the presentation. Please let me know when you see that because I can't see anybody's faces when I'm in this presentation mode. We can see it. Okay, oh, we'll jump in. Uh, so thank you to the committee for allowing us to join you and present today. My name is Nathaniel Wagen. I'm a partner and architect with the uh, Mark Patan Architectural Collaborative. Uh, today we have from the design team, Kaylee Wil Widmer, Mark Patan, uh, Mike, who is our landscape consultant, and as well, uh, the city of Edmonton folks who are on the project with us. So the AIS integrated site is an integrated operations building for the city of Edmonton. It houses multiple user groups, including roads, parks, fleet. Uh, so there's these lower level operation bays and upper level office space. All right, very slow, trying to change the screen here. There we go. Uh, okay, we'll have to go manual. The, the full screen isn't working. I apologize. Uh, so we have this, this quote up here, which we feel is very relevant as it was the starting point for the project. Uh, and what we hit on was that notion of stewardship. And so the way that we understand the project and the nature of the integrated sites is that city operations are key stewards of the city, and they allow for the delivery of key services to service the city of Edmonton and its inhabitants. So the idea of stewardship of the environment is integral to the user groups of the building, which then extends to the fabric of Edmonton as a city. Uh, for some context of Ambleside, uh, Ambleside is an almost urban context, and it's one of the city of Edmonton's most rapidly expanding areas. Uh, within the broader area, so kind of as you see on the site plan here, there's a centennial bus garage, a city snow dump, uh, and then within the city Ambleside proper, there's the 
currently, you know, built eco station as well as a recently competed fuel station. So what's interesting is that this entirety of the Ambleside site can be understood as like the service belt. Uh, so it's a key piece of infrastructure that helps the city grow and operate and allows Edmonton to, to kind of continue its expansion in the south uh, through the delivery of services from Ambleside in its entirety. Uh, the Ambleside site is very, very interesting because it's not, while it's sandwiched between Anthony Hende and Ellerslie Road, and the eco station is somewhat visible uh, toward the east and way where our project is, it's actually on this beautifully raised plateau, so it's quite a bit higher than the adjacent Anthony Hende and Ellerslie Road roads. Uh, for a little bit of background, uh, MBAC has been on the project for a few years, and we did a lot of early explorations with the city when it was just a parks building or roads building. It got amalgamated into this kind of singular service site, uh, and we did a bunch of different studies that very different siting, building orientation, building configuration, uh, and the, the final test fit 5B of which our current project is outlined and is part of, was the design that was chosen by the city's user groups uh, because it delivered the most amount of program. It was the most efficient. Uh, and this was a big highlight for the city because it kind of proved the effectiveness that integration can deliver. Uh, as an urban design approach, it was really kind of one of the governing ways that we understood the site, given its siting, given its overall size, uh, and so the site plan kind of informed the building location and formed the building form. And we developed these kind of highlighted areas that we really wanted to focus on. So one was to create a, a canopy of trees to minimize heat island and integrate planting as, a, as an extension of the notion of stewardship. Uh, we wanted to ensure we provided amenity spaces to the workers and any visitors. Uh, use the building itself as a visual buffer to the operational or dirty side of the, of the yard wanted to make sure there was a visual and auditory buffer for the adjacent communities and roads. Uh, we wanted to elevate the office support staff onto the higher level to provide views and connection to the landscape uh, and really focus on integrating and concealing the building systems from public view. So very much kind of governed by site topography. The building was optimized to act as a site defining element. So while it itself is visible from the adjacent roadways, it also kind of screens and conceals the more operational nature of the overall site. Uh, so the site is composed of light duty on the east here, which is parking, I'm sorry, on the west. And then on the east is the operational side, which as you can see, the AAS facility separates. And so the operational side has very large vehicles. We have graders coming out, snow and ice removal. So that's tried to be kind of concealed and hidden, while the more public side that access to the eco station and others is kind of greeted by the building and the planted areas. <clears throat> Big focus on the site was the notion of safety. So obviously as an operational site, it can be dangerous with very, very large vehicles and heavy vehicles moving. So both the building and the siting are used to separate that operational yard. It's enclosed, as you can see, by a decorative uh, security fence around the perimeter. Uh, and this provides safety not only for light duty, but also for the operational use and make sure that there are no public trespassing in the yard. Lighting was also very considered as a, as a balance of safety and septed. And so we have perimeter building lighting to illuminate it, create this notion of a beacon that the facility offers, uh, as well as lit walkways within the parking lot and a balance of operational lighting while still trying to maintain the, uh, the dark skies and other environmental initiatives. So a balance between operational safety and environmental considerations. Uh, the building form as a long linear mass, which is required for the access of work vehicles as each kind of lower portion is a drive through. So you can drive in one way, drive out. Uh, and what we focused on was kind of creating key articulations in areas to delineate entries, carve the upper floor, and kind of provide amenity through the layout and configuration of the building form itself. And in the foreground, you can see the existing eco station and in the background, the uh, currently completed Ambleside fuel station. 
the development of the building envelope was critical, and it was developed as an idea of the switch in materiality, a lower level where the overhead doors is robust, and then the upper level uh, very in-depth screening elements uh, that are used to capture light, be honorific of the nature of the site, while serving operational requirements for durability and efficiency. So really playing with the idea of an architectural skin, creating opening and porosity to modulate light and views and capture the beautiful skies that we have in Alberta. Uh, so there's this nice opportunity for beautiful rhythm that the facade treatment allows, and that was a focus of the detailing, uh, the way of kind of elevating and having the opportunity for views on the upper floor office, and then on the lower floor here, this idea of a Claire story to allow indirect light into the operations maze. Uh, so it's very important that they have access to natural light as operations, but also that it's indirect so that glare isn't affecting the work that happens there. Uh, so the intent of the building, as we can kind of see here, is to kind of create this dynamic and responsive architecture, as well as an urban design gesture that maintains oper operational efficiency while still being uh, a design excellence as is required for the city. Yeah. Uh, we want it to be emblematic of the city vision to, to be socially and economically responsible through design decisions and optimize that idea of service development for the citizens. So a big focus was to create amenity spaces, both within the building for the users and through previous comments, kind of at a forecourt area, so that people are able to occupy the site and the building. And this has been generated through both rooftop and forecourt amenities, uh, which you can see in greater detail here. So we have a series of rooftop patios, which are carved and offer areas of respite and reprieve for the workers. And the lower level was carved away at this main entry to develop a very, very welcoming public facade. As you can see in this image, the, the amenity is really integrated into the building with the folding back of the skin as a way of kind of breaking up and illustrating the importance of the stewardship that the building and the site offers. Operationally, we have the main floor, which is drive through bays for the operations. Again, this idea of flexibility is inherent through the openness and <coughs> dynamic change of all the user groups. Uh, and the second level is all offices for the workers that support that. Uh, Mike Evans for the last slide will speak to some of the, the landscape operations and approach. From the informal presentation we did on in December, we had some feedback that we've uh, in now integrated into the current plan that includes more uh, indigenous species as opposed to some of the ornamental ones that we had before. That picks up some of the uh, coniferous that that happens in the ravine setting to the southeast. We still maintained uh, a high proportion of tree planting. So we're exceeding the tree requirement and we've reduced the shrub requirement. Uh, so we're, we're, we've requested a variance to get that uh, match made in terms of numbers. And so we exceed the, the numbers that we need. We still are going with some of the ornamental coloring that we, that we had intended at the start and those beds are along that south edge only to the extent of the east side of the building and then along the the narrow separation between the access to the bays and the parking lot all the rest of the parking lot islands are uh, native uh, grasses which is now becoming uh, a requirement uh, of the city to try and reduce the amount of mowing. Uh, we're we're still a very drought resistant uh, planting plan because we don't have any irrigation intended in this project. Turn it back to you, Nathaniel. 
Perfect. Well, thank you, Mike. Uh, well, that was, I believe, our, our 10 minutes. So we're eager to chat with you further, answer any questions, and, and go from there. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. I'll start us off with questions. Starting off with Craig. Sorry. Uh, yeah. First. I'm in the mute button again. I'm first. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, I don't have any comments per se. I uh, um, appreciate the responses in the package uh, from the, the last go around. Um, yeah, that's it. Thanks. Short and to the point. Next is Emma. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'll echo Craig's comment. I think it's the projects is developing really nicely. Um, I just had a more less of a comment and more just a question or a clarifier. Um, in the package under the, the good neighbor section, he said, uh, in compliance with the current COE requirements, the vertical anti-climb decorative fence will enclose the entire AIS site. Um, and I just didn't see any details of that in the package. So I was just wondering if you could provide a bit more information on the height, the material, open area, color, extent, just a just a few details on that would be um, would be good to uh, discuss. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for the question. Uh, so that's it, it closes the operational area. If you recall, at the site plan, there is a dashed line, uh, and so the big thing for that is safety. Uh, so it's a scan in, scan in only for the operational vehicles. Uh, obviously, you can also drive through the building, uh, but that's meant to limit the access to the operation yard. Uh, and it also kind of prevents anyone from coming up through the ravine. In turn, and we can I can share that slide with you again if you'd like. Uh, in terms of materiality, there's a city standard. It's a black omega fence, so it's vertical black pickets. Uh, we would say it's a decorative fence. It's usually six to seven feet high, uh, and it has kind of integrated gates. So it's a system that's used on a number of yards, as it is you know much more designed than than a chain link, and there's no nasty razor wire. Or anything. So, uh, again, a big one for for safety and access. I can share that slide with you if you'd like to sh to show the extent. Uh, no, no, I think that's clear. If it's just um, specific to the to the east sort of zone, I think that's that's really all the the clarity I need. I wasn't sure if it was around like the whole scope yeah. or if it, whether if it was just the yard. But no, that's that's some great clarity. That that was all I had. Thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you. And that pass it to Nick. Hold up, I can. Thanks uh, very much again for the presentation. I don't really have too many comments. So I must admit, it's probably the fanciest public works building I've ever seen. So <laughs> um, kudos there. Um, just the only thing I, I'm curious on is just around the sustainability components. Uh, does it look to have solar, or uh, I'm just trying to understand that section in there, or you're talking about. Um, Maybe you could just explain a little bit on the energy side yeah. of the building. Yeah, absolutely. And sorry, uh, I caught myself having to speed up. 10 minutes goes by pretty fast. Uh, <laughs> so it is a targeted lead silver building uh, on the upper level roof. Uh, there's a full, I believe it's close to, I can't recall the exact kilowatt, but the entirety of the second floor roof uh, has a PV system. Uh, so we are uh, targeting, I think, 30% better than any CV for energy consumption. Uh, we're meeting all the required Tenny targets uh, for glazing. And um, as part of the project, which is an IPD, we have a sustainability consultant. Uh, and so we've uh, tweaked the building envelope, glazing amounts, uh, glazing total to ensure all the energy requirements are met. Thank you. Uh, that looks good. Thank you. Next, Kevin. Thank you. Thanks for the presentation. Um, I have some questions and some comments. Firstly, um, I'm a big fan of the building itself. I think it's a really uh, very handsome building. Um, uh, I think, you know, for being what needs to be a very uh, functional structure and facility, it still has um, has a very fine appearance. My comments are around 
the opening statement and the focus on stewardship and uh, long heritage and stewards for an immense future. And part of our immense future includes really dramatic climate change and um, and weather patterns and and issues related to heat and drought. So I'm. My impression, especially when I look at the overall site master plan on page five, I think it was, is there is an extremely high amount of parking on the site. This site is basically paved with the minimum amount of setback yards and landscape islands and parking lots as kind of required by the standards. So, how did the team investigate trying to incorporate um, more formative ecological features on the site that can help to mitigate stormwater runoff, uh, impacts to the ravine, heat island effect? I know you talk about it and there's some planting in the front parking lot, but the backyard with the fleet parking and, the, uh, and that is, is uh, I'm struggling to appreciate how we're stewarding the land with that approach yeah that's that's a good question and it's fair uh i think that's a struggle we've uh done several operational sites and the notion of stewardship is that the the users of this steward the city so it's green spaces as well as its roads and the means of conveyance for all edmontonians so parks is one of those and so is roads and ice for snow clearing uh, we find it's kind of just an unfortunate demand that at times there's going to be double shift changes and during snow and ice events, it's a safety thing where you have to make sure that everybody who is working is able to come and park and deploy. And then you have that almost doubled up parking so that users are able to go switch shifts and kind of continue on to make sure there is no service interruption. Uh, we did work with the user groups to try to minimize the amount of parking we are providing slightly lower than the ideal amount of stalls. Uh, we did look into ways of offsetting it, including permeable and other ones, but unfortunately they just don't work with the operational requirements of the yard. Uh, we did try to offset it through, again, a number of excess trees, breaking up, uh, especially the light duty parking. And it, it is a challenge from operations to try to get as much program and possible and be as efficient as possible uh, and obviously dealing with the with the heat island effects. Yeah, and I think I would add to Nate's note that, as you mentioned, we act, we are providing less uh, light duty parking than uh, originally requested uh, by the user group, so we're under that value. But in terms of the operation side, if we were to reduce the amount of paved yard space that we're currently providing that space is still required by the city. And so that would likely have to be provided via another operations yard. So if we made that more efficient or reduce that uh, to tackle any of these challenges, that would just have to be offset by another facility because the amount of fleet parking, the storage for sand piles, the storage for all the elements that's required for city operations, that doesn't go away if we make that a more green space. So we are in a way compensating for these uh, future things by making this as a tight efficient site as possible and i know it's challenging because it does look like a lot of asphalt but the intent is to actually reduce the number of overall facilities that the city needs to provide by making this a very efficient uh site and allowing that integration to occur there yeah and that thank you Ken. that's such a great point that um the notion of the integrated sites by combining the user groups we reduce the total amount of buildings the total amount of inefficiency for multiple parking lots so instead of having four or five buildings and four or five parking lots with all these act like access ways by consolidating them we do reduce the total number uh, sorry mark i see you have your hand up as well I was just going to make that same point I, I mean i think the comments are fair if you just look at the facility and imagine it as a conventional um building on a conventional site but the fact of the matter is the conventional definition of this building would have been five separate sites with five separate um, um maintenance plans and operations plans and building servicing and so the the stewardship really 
was um, pushed through through the kind of diagram of the integration of all these business units into one um, facility. And one thing that's uh, super important, um, and Nathaniel uh, hinted at it, is when Parks starts to uh, shrink its team in winter, other business units expand. So the 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 building is used at you know ninety to one hundred percent of its capacity all year long. <clears throat> Yeah, I appreciate the notion of efficiency and and I totally appreciate how stretched operational budgets are and um, the need to be efficient. I don't want to belabor the point, but would two facilities rather than five that were designed to be more sustainable have less of an environmental impact than one building that is um, you know, has quite an environmental footprint on it. And I know that's outside the scope of your assignment. So just food for thought, but I, I am struggling with the amount of paved area and the lack of um, kind of ecological functionality on the site. Yeah, that, that's a fair question. Early on, again, during the master plan, we actually did a cost analysis and total impact analysis of the one building versus five. Again, I think 40 to 60% of a building's uh, encapsulated carbon is based in the foundation uh, and the structure. So by having a singular foundation and structure, you eliminate all, all of that excess carbon. So by splitting it into two, you are drastically less efficient because of the embedded energy requirements for that, those kind of initial mobilizations. And that's, you know, you never capture that back. No, I appreciate it. And like I said, this is not necessarily within our purview to be discussing these higher level considerations. So uh, I think I will leave it there so that other folks have a chance as well. Thank you, Kevin. Now, on that note, Mindy, you are next. Yes, thank you, Neil. And thank you very much for your presentation. Um, echoing some of my colleagues, I don't have any questions. I think it's a lovely project. Look forward to seeing it. And I really appreciated the very comprehensive package you provided us with. So, so thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Ty, you're next. Sure, thanks, Neil. Yeah, th thanks to the team. I, I agree. I think it's, it's a really lovely um, project. I, I had um, maybe just on the heels of Kevin's comment about the extensive um, pavement area, I was just wondering if the team had considered any kind of permeable um, paving or high reflective um, uh, kind of pavement to reduce the heat island uh, effect and some of those permeability concerns potentially. Yeah, we, we had, so we did a high level sustainability ones. Uh, we did total um, uh, environmental impact assessments as well. Uh, we had looked at permeable pavement. Unfortunately, there are other uh, city requirements uh, that they just weren't able to meet, especially given the operational uh, requirements from facilities and maintenance. Uh, and this has to do along with the, with the durability and collection and integration of, of some stormwater things. Uh, so unfortunately, it wasn't quite applicable, but we did look at it at a, at a, at a high level for both costing and efficiency uh, and total integration. Uh, we haven't looked at more of a high albedo one, uh, but I think that's a, a great suggestion, something we can definitely look at. Uh, great. And then I, I guess my other question was just sort of around the um, the architectural uh, cladding strategy with the with the fins. Um, I, am I under, to understand that there's, um, I guess from your report, it sounds like there's um, like it's it's kind of a standard standing seam kind of product that you're um, in certain locations to create those fins. You're kind of bringing them out around uh, like a metal stud framing kind of approach. Um, and it, okay, is, is there anywhere where that comes down kind of to grade, or is is that generally all held up at that second story or higher? Yeah, no, that's that's another great question. I'm glad you brought it up because we like our climbing approach. Yeah. Uh, so one of the, the benefits of doing such a large building is that we have a lot of suppliers eager to work with us. And again, the city is leveraging the IPD model. So we, we have the, uh, the capacity to do design assists, which is, which is, which is great. Uh, so we're currently working with uh, the contractor and uh, different cladding suppliers. And the intent is it's not a, a standard uh, standing scene. The methodology is the same. 
uh, but working with the suppliers, the depth of the, the seam or the fin that's created by the standing seam will vary based on the program that it's contained within. Uh, so it will extend over windows to create uh, better screening for the office inhabitants below. It's thinner at the lower level above the Claire story to allow light in but avoid glare. So it's very performative based on the, the use behind it. Uh, it doesn't come down to the main level, although above our kind of main entry levels that extends deeper to kind of create an implied canopy as well as signifying the main entries. Uh, and we wanted to keep it higher above for, for durability. Below yeah, that, that was going to be my question. So, yeah. Okay. No, that that's uh, that's great. I, I feel better about that. And it is a really nice, uh, really nice strategy. So I'm eager to see it uh, in real life. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks. On that note, uh, I'll pass it to David. Uh, yeah, thanks for your presentation. Um, just a couple of questions. So uh, on page 11, you the site design page, there were a number of different, uh, I guess, explorations with regards to the site design layout. And I'm, I was just wondering if those were done prior to coming to the EDC informal or were uh, done after the fact? Yeah, so the governing principles were developed during the Ambleside Master Plan which okay. has been over the development over several years. Uh, the primary one being that notion of good neighbor and screening and amenity space. Uh, I think after the informal EDC, we wanted to highlight them because, you know, in the informal, it's hard to get everything out there and there's a lot of detail in the project. Uh, so we forefronted them just to kind of illustrate that that was really the guiding principle behind the master plan. And while this is only a portion of the master plan, all of those were kind of the guiding urban design principles that were really critical in the project due to the just the immense scale of the Ambleside site. All right. Uh, so I, I'm just going to go back, like when you came in for the informal, um, one of my questions, and it's sort of building off of what Kevin was talking about, but I, I had asked if there was any consideration on the orientation or the adjustment to the form and massing of the buildings along the edge of the White Mud Creek. So you'd be actually maximizing upper floor views and potential connectivity along and into the creek area. And then also along Anthony Hende so that you'd actually be showcasing the building rather than having it set back. And um, sort of internalizing some of those operation yards and parking areas. So like that was a question and I had a whole list of reasons behind that um, questioning, uh, but I, I did not see that in any of the site design options that were presented on page 11. So I, I so I guess I, I asked the question again, like, you know, what was there any ex exploration to sort of you know, in, and as I said, I, I do have a whole list of reasons why I'm asking this question, um, but it does deal with, you know, better integration of the built form with the surrounding context and, you know, much more of an eco ecological and more social sustainable approach to, to, to the layout of, of, I have no concerns with the building, but just how the site is arranged, um, it is still in my mind a little convoluted yeah no for sure i mean yeah we we did a number of explorations uh part of the orientation and the total form of the building were the result of trying to optimize the amount of program that could be delivered through it and the intent of optimizing program is it's the most sustainable way right we, we have talked about it earlier in terms of fewer buildings and fewer sites less individual buildings less foundations you know efficiency is kind of through the form uh, and so in all the studies, one of the big drivers being an operational yard is the idea of safety and access to the building. Uh, given the location of the bank, there, there are issues with the stability of the bank. And so we purposely didn't put anything too close to there. And so that's why it's not pushed all the way toward the east. Uh, that perhaps would be possible, uh, but it would be ecologically detrimental to the bank and the soil stability and would require very expensive foundations due to that. Uh, so that's why the building isn't necessarily pushed too much to the east and it is just the operations that are. That are. 
uh, in terms of the siding to the Hende. While it's on a plateau, what you'll be able to see driving on the Hende is the beautiful kind of upper level of the building, which captures and modulates the light. With the fins, you get this beautiful effect because of the spacing as you drive by the spacing changing. And so the east-west portion of the future was aligned to the Hende to illustrate that. Uh, because of the grade differences, the building acts as a screen. And so you don't actually see the operational yards from the roads, either by elevation or by the orientation of the building. Okay. And I'll just uh, echo Nate. Um, so we are in part of phase two, we will have the building along the Anthony Hende. So it will be showcased uh, in the next phase of the project. And then in addition to slope stability issues with locating the building adjacent to the ravine, uh, in order to design an efficient facility, both sides of the building had to be accessible to the operations team. And so even if we were able to get it close, we'd still have to offset the building away from the slopes. That way the operations could occupy both sides of the building or else it would have had to been a much bigger building, uh, a lot more linear. So overall, this was the most efficient uh, in terms of uh, site location, and then we're still showcasing the building along the Anthony Hende in uh, phase two. And maybe one more thing, we, we established some metrics for success at the start of the project, um, and for sure optimization was very key, key from a sustainability point of view and key from a, a optimization of workflows and, and seasonality. But one of the other metrics was being a good neighbor, which was an extension of stewardship that Nathaniel presented. And what we tried to do was that the buildings defined a kind of a clean side and a, and a, a less clean side, if you will. And in that sense, the neighborhood, those that can see the building can are really seeing the kind of more um, cleaner side of the building. So that idea of being a good neighbor was embedded in the idea of stewardship, which was primarily a, an environmental sustainability piece, but it was also about good neighbors. Okay, thank you. On that note, I'm, I'm wrapping up the uh, question order. So overall, of course, really fond of this building, love this, uh, appreciate the siting, the rigor of the design. I think I share the concerns with the, not the operational parking lot, but the front parking lot and the landscape plan. So my question is looking at the landscape plan, what looks like a large lawn between the parking lot and the access road, what is going on in that space? Uh, so I can actually speak to that. Um, so again, we, we are trying to ensure that the efficiency of the overall Ambleside master plan is maintained. In the future, when the next phase goes ahead, uh, it will take and remove the stormwater pond because we, the site will be outside of capacity. So underneath that seated area is going to be underground stormwater storage tanks. Uh, and so we didn't want to plant trees or bushes that in the next five or 10 years might have to be all dug up and removed. So we thought simple kind of seeding of native grasses would be a good interim kind of solution and as a way of ensuring that we don't do something now that is going to impact the overall master plan in the future. I mean, does that, that helps a lot. I was worried it would look like a la large lawn and would actually not be a nice co um, uh, companion to this building and its uh, relatively sensitive siting. So that, that was my prior concern is I think the missed opportunities in the parking lot to maybe soften those edges a little, but uh, I, I'm very happy with this project overall. Oh, and we have one more follow-up. Absolutely. Sorry, I just want to follow up, Nathan. You said there's going to be stormwater storage located beneath that open lawn area, okay. and that will remain as lawn area with storage beneath it? Uh, we're not sure what will come above the underwater stormwater tanks in the future. It might have to be additional parking if that's required for the future expansion of the building. Perhaps we can plant. We just wanted to designate that as the capacity in that area aligns with the total required capacity for underground storage in the future. Okay, because uh, there is a potential that you could incorporate that within the parking area and still accommodate tree planting. Yeah. Um, and then have more green space available for uh, ecological features and function. And it relates to another 
element of the, the plan that there's no irrigation planned for the site in order to get the lead points. But if you have that stormwater storage, did you investigate uh, reusing the captured stormwater for irrigation on site, in particular to the rooftop patios where they're shown as planting? Yeah, those are actually so we, really challenging environments to keep plants alive. Um, and so they're shown as really green, but long term, is the maintenance capacity in place to keep those amenity spaces uh, and the exterior landscaping in a kind of a vigor, a state of vigor and, and health? Yeah, no, that those are those are great points. Uh, we tend to recommend non-watering for the lawns and trees and planting as, as just a sustainable measure, kind of regardless of weed. Uh, and so we always try to make sure we have as little water impact as possible. Uh, the stormwater is in the underground tanks aren't going ahead at this current phase. Uh, so we, we don't have the capacity to trap the stormwater that we might be able to use. I believe there are actual bylaws that are fairly strict on what you can reuse the stormwater for. I don't believe you can actually use it for public watering due to contamination. Uh, I believe we've had this discussion before with what we can use stormwater or runoff for. In the future, we are going to have building wash bays, and that's where we would use that stormwater. So for the cleaning of the vehicles and the trucks, where it isn't going to be used for kind of public consumption or the risk of contaminated water coming into contact with the public. We also looked at using that water as a source of um, cleaning the vehicles so that they weren't using pot city water and potable water for those purposes. Okay, and then in, in terms of the planting, I'm sure Mike can speak to it. Uh, but because one of a few of the groups are the PARs, so parks individuals that do the planting, uh, the idea is that because of their facility, these plants will be well taken care of beautified by the actual building inhabitants so that that notion of a social contract through the integration of these will be stewarded by the by the user groups as that is you know part of their purview and they will want to have that beautiful building to illustrate the, the importance of the work that they do okay i i appreciate that in principle and i'll leave it at that Okay. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you for bringing this before the Edmonton Design Committee. We will take a. Uh, we will begin our deliberations. It's up to you, I believe, if you want to remain. But otherwise, uh, we will. Eat. Whether you remain or not, it's your choice. But we will absolutely update you within how many days now? Two days. Two days. Forty-eight <laughs> hours. Yeah. We will let you know where we've landed on this. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye. Okay, we have a doc that's been shared. Any comments up front? Mm. Quietly slip out the front door here. Thank you. Yeah. You are Ashley, and I've never even met you in person, so we always talk on the time. So nice to meet you. You too. Okay, have a good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. So I noticed that in, I'm curious on the uh, the comment about I didn't quite understand that underground storage one because if you can clean the trucks, that's a hazard for water as much yeah. as it is. But the other one is, I you know you could bring in look at low impact design as well in yeah. the space they have. So that grass area could have become a more naturalized area. So I actually wouldn't. Well, someone's putting it in i see you putting some stuff and i think they should explore that a little bit more because we're near, we're near a river system and so recharge and all those sorts of things are important within our water i think that's the the only thing i think design's fine but that's the one i tend to agree I, i'm not you know to have tanks underground and i think they could do more lid given the surface area they have. So, yeah You'd have to relocate the building and it's a big move but well they're not going to do that no. so that, I, that i didn't that's why i didn't go any further with, with any of my questions so um yeah but i i do think there's some 
missed opportunities um, with regards to the site design that actually go I, I, I maybe contradict some of the main points that they've made yes um you know it really doesn't address the creek it really doesn't address the highway it doesn't address the users that are using the creek system and, and trail system uh, it certainly doesn't address the, some of the ecological and social sustainability opportunities that this site provides um so i just i just dumped all of my notes into <laughs> and into the thing there just it's just some of the things that I just I find are are real some real some missed opportunities. Um, they they opted for efficiency in operations and I'm sure cost as well as the top priority over functionality, like uh, holistic functionality and ecological sustainability, oh, okay. and that's a fundamental decision early in the project. It would be kind of cool if if they actually created a, a working landscape you yeah. know like if you if you if, if it's going to be owned and operated by the operations people this is a great testing yeah. ground right yeah. to doing doing different things that have much more low impact um and and ecological diversity right yeah. so here's a great breeding ground or testing ground for, for doing stuff and so, yeah. so the lead standard they're going for is for the building only. They're not doing neighborhoods lead. It, it's for site building. But site, site, yeah, yeah, incorporated in that would be any of the site site related uh, points that they would be, which would be, you know, I think Mike indicated like no irrigation, blah blah blah. So, like the band minimum. So but, yeah. yeah, but you know, um, it, it wouldn't get. The, what is that urban design point? Because as I said, I, I think it's just missing, lacking that connectivity with any of the surrounding contexts. So the whole, I mean, I, I drive that area and it's not exactly a, <laughs> a, a space that I'd call walkable or whatever. So I think there's the buildings. You've got, some, you've got the bus step right there. You've got the recycling center there. You've yeah. got the buildings are rather... So if any buildings stand out, I look at it from a building point of view. To me, though, the main point is, I think, the given the impermeable surface area and the location to a water course, the, the low impact design is something I think is an important element that they, given the space they have, there's no reason why they couldn't be incorporated. But that's my opinion. Well, as I said, I just from this context of neighborhood or city connectivity right like i would say that the only the main form of connectivity right now that's there right now is both the white mud creek and the highway itself right so and as i said in my in my opinion especially along white mud creek the whole design turns its back against that element so it's not a really a good neighbor gesture really and it certainly doesn't serve um opportunities great oppor connectivity opportunities between those that are in that building that forecourt area that they've designed and you know like i think they have all of their holding pens all of their storage bins yeah, along the, I, as i said i just so you, i you just have a problem you, with you that taking into account there's another element that's going to go in there that's a new bridge that's going to come across ellis mm -hmm. Lee road and so that's what I was also thinking of in context. I was going to actually ask them the question as to how it might, um, which is going to have, you know, probably a more substantial effect. I mean, I walk that White Mud Creek. I live in the area, so mm -hmm. I still know it mm -hmm. um, reasonably well. But I, I think uh, the horse was out of the barn by the time we saw this project. Mm -hmm. The real impactful decision should have been made at the master planning stage in deciding on the scale of the facility and how you could make a sustainable site. But the way the program has been loaded into those buildings, like mm -hmm. there is no, like it's, it just can't function without being the way it is now. And you can't just like, stitch on LID facilities now onto the way the site's laid out because of grade A and 
storm infrastructure and stuff like you might be able to get little pockets here but to make a measurable impact on the site it needed to have been reconfigured yeah i mean i'm looking at all that grass space that could have an old chain but the grading is going to be the biggest impact mm -hmm. related to it um that's his biggest battle yeah it's around the world must be happy to be there to see it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the city, you know, should have some responsibility to be leading the charge in demonstrating, you know, the right approaches to, to site developments and stuff. And then to see something like this that is just like the bare minimum of finish and performance on a site like developers are more sensitive to sites so so we came across this and it's unusual because Paulette park i remember when we had that come to us and there was no lid and i know it call look out stormwater because they pay the city to help with some of their projects on lid and that uh, you know like why are we why is the city capitalizing on that opportunity i don't understand why so here's another example of a city project that is trying to, you know, we all agree with the building, but we're missing it. With the climate change and the issues that we're facing, you know, water course, we're not doing the appropriate tools. That's the area that concerns people. That's my thing. So I'm not trying to understand, but that area from an orientation of building, I just, it's just not really orientated for pedestrian and the trail system you're below so you're not really that obvious but the stormwater to me is a big issue where it's like a, and just so sees of parking better <laughs> unbroken with yeah any sort of planting or shading and i get that for the operation but totally yeah you have huge vehicles that yeah. need to make complex maneuvers in there yeah but the front one yeah. <laughs> even the back like in the fleet parking area they're yeah. just parking like maybe one ton trucks, they can break that in. Anyways. And you bust it by just up the road, surely. <laughs> <laughs> the operation is always tough, right? Because yeah. you, you have moments yeah, moments where everyone has to be there like 4 a.m., right? Storm totally, yeah. I, I get it. I'm, like, I, I'm, I'm, all, I'm more sensitive to those, but. Yeah. yeah. That's why I'm struggling with how that approaches. And because it was so far gone by the time we saw it, it's been, like even for the, informal yeah yeah and the last plane is interesting because there's a face too so you can come across why aren't we thinking about it at the last plan in terms of you know i go back to it it's part of that riparian margin that feeds into uh, saskatchewan river and all those other aspects which are very planning sensitive or important elements does anyone online think Um, I'm, I mean, this is a really interesting discussion to follow. I'm, I, I was looking back through their report um, and their response to the, the principles of design. Um, and I, I really feel like there's a missed opportunity here in terms of how it, it brings in and relates to uh, its unique context of location in, in terms of the, the trail system and, and, and the creek. Um, and yeah, and instead of sort of talking about how it, it could maybe engage um, pedestrian traffic through the creek, for example, uh, th through those trails, it, it's talking more about how it serves as a beacon of architectural refinement and it, how design excellence can be applied to any scale and typology. And I, I like to me, I, I think um, there's a piece around like design excellence actually being contextual right and offering you know certainly as a city building at least like how how could it provide some amenity uh maybe to that rather than just sort of a you know a landscape screen which I, i'm seeing along that edge and then you know a lot of parking for one ton trucks right so it, it would be interesting and and yeah this might be too far gone potentially but i like i think that um yeah, like, like maybe there's an opportunity there. It'd be interesting to think about how, like what kind of amenity could it offer? Like what would you want to experience uh, if, if you were a member of the public sort of in that area? Yeah. 
the excess part they probably struggle with because of the safety reasons around you know, the vehicles. That'll be the, the biggest challenge there. But but like if you were working there and you wanted to go for a walk in the ravine, you can't get there from here. Yeah, and, like like that connection hasn't even been yeah. thought about. No. Yeah. Yeah, reversing around where office people just need the mental health break as much yeah. and you've got the opportunity for it. Yeah, there's some nice little picnic tables up on there. <laughs> they have views of yeah. Yeah, sure. and the amenity space they put by the front door where the public is walking and not where staff would feel comfortable allowing you. Yeah. Anyways. So is there a fence guy? I I assume it's gonna have a fence around. Yeah, yeah. It's surrounded by fence except for that public entry. Yeah. Mm. Like their approach is that the building is so fantastic, and I think it's great. Yeah, they're but they're like, the but they're yeah. like, it's got everything. It's yeah, got, yeah. it's got outdoor it's decks. Fence. It's got this. Like, why would you, why would you want to go to the ravine? Yeah. We've got everything here, yeah. right? So, you're yeah. working in a beacon. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so the, uh, the building's being pulled up. The surrounding has to be The building yeah. deserves a better, better uh, sanction, right? yeah. which is where. The, well when it came to us it was already in its current configuration right like i'm looking right. back at their, yeah. i'm looking at back at their test fits and it <laughs> see and it and it seems like in almost all of them all of that bulk storage yeah. like the sand and whatnot is next to arguably the most ecologically sensitive edge of the site yeah. And that, that's why I asked the question I did because that wasn't presented in the first uh, informal. So that's why I had asked that question as to what came first, the chicken or the egg. So. So what we would like to see would be a fundamental redesign of the site. <laughs> <laughs> and how well. Uh, yeah, yeah. In lieu of do a make make a better parking uh, loft. I don't think that's going to happen. No, but, it's not going to happen. But it doesn't mean as a design commit. I mean, we we can support and make recommendations around the surrounding. I mean, at least get some treatment but, around. I I think I well what we have written right now. I think. You know, maybe this should be considered the next facility that goes on. And now, I, Kevin, I also think that in the overall planning, like, you know, of this facility or and site, um, maybe they try to stuff too much oh, into totally. the site, <laughs> which I think is a valid thing to to also indicate. Yeah. Um, well, it can on the resource the land, I guess, but it's how do you balance it? It's seems like a lot. I'm sure it will function very well. But yes. Any other edits? We have a relatively coherent motion. Staff may disagree. Read okay to you, Peter. Well, you have some good points, but I don't know if that means that there's a motion there. Good motion sports. Support with all the recommendations. <laughs> you should just start with three. Yeah, I, I guess the question is does someone want to make a motion? Yeah. I will make a motion of support. Okay. Do we have a second? Yeah, I think I'll second that. I think we need to. Uh, so this is with our. Uh, Considerations, right? Yes. 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 So, within our considerations, can we provide some commentary on the fact that it's over programmed? The site is over programmed. Yeah. In light of an environmental and sustainability considerations, and that in future, and this relates to our conversation that we're going to have after, is. Uh, should see this project earlier. Yeah. Really. We need to do it. At the You've said that at other projects. Yeah. No. Yeah, and what's funny, Kevin, like point, like really good point, but and, and what's funny is that usually when we see a site that's over programmed, it's like the building is is so big 
that it you know there's no space for for landscaping or, or things like that and i think in in this case it's um the programming is like non-building programming right yeah so what did you say there can i just said the committee welcomes this proposed development however the committee believes that this project that the project is the over programmed yeah are, are we saying the site or is it also the, the building the last the, the the oh the project yeah i get what you're saying because the building is over programmed and and um as a result there is very limited uh, opportunity for uh, ecological or uh, social, like the connection to the surroundings. How would you eloquently say that? It's almost recognizing the uh, for ecological performance or. Uh, Nice relationship with life and the structure. Yeah. Thank you for taking on. I was just scribing. You were talking, I was scribing. With the surrounding context. We can work, we can wordsmith this. Just yeah. get the big get the big pieces. Yeah. Uh, several key considerations should connect up with learning the that's where your sensitivity comes in, which is contextually different to the further away. Are the bullets we're seeing below are potential opportunities for right. further consideration or? Yeah, we're saying the recommends the applicant further consider. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I added the, As the superfluous ball. consider on C1 there. But. Is the third bullet and the last bullet uh, a is one redundant? I think so. Oh, okay. Oh, third, sorry, I just looked at the fourth. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree with that. Can we uh, change low impact development to low impact design? Other than it's a separate uh, principle. So, yeah, yeah let's leave it. Yeah. And you were saying a low impact design, well, rather than low impact development. EPCOR, design is a, no, EPCOR calls it low impact development. They do? Yeah. That's yeah. formal. Yeah. Mm. Typical. Right. I don't know. Uh, what degree are A2 and A3 <clears throat> repetitive? Yeah. And the last one. Yeah, that was the yeah, discussion. They're yeah. separate principles, I guess. Oh, right. Sorry. C1 stands, the bottom one stands on its own. So it's talking about trusty data. It's a trouble memory of each one. I be able to cite sensory. Yeah. Are we asking? What are you asking me? It's just there's some repetition there, but what's been pointed out is that it, regardless, the, the reference to specific principles there. So if they're repetitive, they're repetitive. I think that's what I mean. 
A2 and A3 and C1 are arguably you know, variations on the same concept. Yeah, um, C1 is the most uh, directive. I think in the past you've sometimes, David, like a bullet will actually reference multiple principles with the same kind of. Uh, yeah, we don't have to add the principal references in there. I just, that's the way I went about it when I. Well, that's actually what you all agreed to. Okay. <laughs> that's fine. Back in the day that you would, okay. as much as possible, you would refer to them. So. Okay. So would it be clear if. I'll uh, tweak number two and then we can get rid of number three. Okay. Well, or like I guess what I'm trying to say, if if A two and A three are A two are A three, yeah, yeah exactly. exactly, yeah. Tell me if this still works. Yeah, so that was A two and A three. I guess, I and mean, I guess that is for staff visitors and visit visitors to the site, and also trail users. That's one that tied in at C one. I guess they are. Yeah. Okay. No. Yeah. We're good. Yeah. Are you good with those amendments, edits? As I yep. Okay. We're done. Okay. Uh, we have a motion on the table, seconded by Nick. Um, I'll go through the order of which I see. <laughs> David? Yes. Kevin? No support. Zip? I support. Ty? Support. Greg? Find that mute button. <laughs> Sorry, my network's cutting out support. Mindy. Support. So I forgot the numbers, but that motion passes. Yeah. 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 Script. What do we do now? Well, it would be an opportune time to have dinner. Yeah, note. But as a reminder, uh, I'm going to paraphrase, but just for the benefit of the committee, it might be good to just remember that, like non support, what it's defined as is something to the effect of that there's significant change required. It's not that it's back to the drawing board, it's that, you know. There's significant things that need to be reconsidered, and that 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 doesn't mean it gets thrown out. It just means it's around the severity of the change that's required. Yeah. So maybe at the end of the day, non-support's not the right term because it does sound like a yes or no. It's about degrees. But you, you, in your case, you didn't do non-support for you did non-support for the motion. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah which is effectively the same thing. Yeah. yeah. But I think I mean, what you're that, there's a whole is, wide yeah, bandwidth of what the motion we're making, we probably should have gone more. No, I'm not I'm not directing the committee in any way. I'm just reminding the committee that that the support, non support is not necessarily a thumbs up and thumbs down. It's that one is that yeah. not support means it's it's generally in good shape, and non support in the new scheme of things is that it's generally not in good shape. Yeah. So yeah, I, I get, I, and tell you the honest truth, I get very concerned, especially with some of the verbiage that I saw in that recent spreadsheet about perceptions of, of our opinion. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like, as far as I'm concerned, this project came to us way too late. Yeah. yeah. So, like, um, that's a broader issue. In many ways. Yes. Well, but it, it is, very but, relevant but, to this one. Yeah. but you, yeah. then you have to, that weighs on the fact of, yeah. of supporting a motion or of support or not, right? Like Kevin said, no, I probably would have said no as well. But like, what point is is that? Like, yeah. as I said, like, it's, 
it's kind of yeah, but, yeah. pointless. Uh, that's what I struggle with that. Well, it sounds well, like you're going to lead the conversation after dinner then. Yeah, well, on that and note, th then we will close no. the review process yeah. uh, portion of the agenda. We will commence the dinner portion of the agenda. Yeah. So how much time have this conversation? How much time do you want to have? We should let the folks at home know how long they're going to be off the hook for. Do you want to work while you eat, or do you? Yeah. Okay. Let's so what do you want? 10, get 10 minutes to use the washroom and grab some food. So folks at home, about ten minutes, and we'll be back. I have a, a long okay. list of proud. Oh look, non support. Peter, you brought wine. That's nice. A long list of proud. <laughs> yeah. So all non supports. I'm only getting my own. Yeah. Like, Wait, there's own. wine. I'll I'll be there in <laughs> two minutes. <laughs> Design a tour in Vancouver of all the projects I was the sole non support for. Yeah. yeah. I remain proud of. I'm gonna hear about it. Yeah. All right, so far so good. Yeah. Should I leave the streaming? I guess, yeah, for, if everyone's going to work while they're eating. Uh, I wanted the same thing, but I I think I would just leave it stream. Yeah. I don't, I don't, uh, as long as you don't get into that wine, uh, <laughs> do something silly. Yeah, yeah. Are you in support of the lasagna or not? <laughs> No, we're on a budget here, David. So no, I, I, I was just wondering why this is here. I'm just kidding. Oh, that's a good question. I'm not sure why that is there. That's my site. Maybe it was just, maybe it was just for the utilities. No, no, no. I, I would I get fired right away. I was running this this joint. That's like. Twelve dollars worth of cheese. That means. Was that a cake meeting? I don't know. Actually, what's on that? I think there's only five machines. So this is probably. Some sauce. Some real bacon bits. Ah, so I was okay. I was interested. There's not a good thing. We do work with you guys. Hmm? We do work with you guys. Oh, which uh, now engineers. I mean, try and meet your bosses for over several years now because one of our your clients wants to 
you know, work together on stuff. I look out the planning side, but oh, yeah. uh, we've got our engineers. So you might have worked with Deborah, the Lindsay Johnson. Oh, of course, Deb. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 She's yeah. One of my, uh, yeah. She's uh, I've worked with her on all of the, yeah. uh, the Northwest work and stuff. So, she's, you know, it's been some. No, he's uh that. with uh, north america for the lab so he wants us to be doing all the planning and, and engineering but you guys do so you did the building that's just opposite the hospital for um, um brand new building oh what you're there yeah, 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 do they have like food services on the main floor? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They have, um, he's with Tynus. So, anyway, who are you, your bosses are the ones I want to try and. Oh, sure. Uh, Peter Osborne. Mm. He's a. Uh... Like, you can't do it. Come on, dude. We're going to meet up. Because, um, so yeah, it'd be keen to. Peter, and who's the other guy? Partners, we have in Edmonton are, uh, yeah, there's Peter Osborne, there's Jason Parry, um, Adrian Benoit, yeah, and, Adrian. Uh, and Richard Lewin. Richard. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, Edmonton, and then we have studios in Calgary and so yeah. Toronto as well. So. Yeah. Um, I mean, you probably do a lot of the fungible we'll planning yourselves or something, but. Um, I mean, I always love it if somebody else can do it. Yeah, to be yeah, honest, yeah. Well, most actors like to stay out of the mm -hmm. the politics. Of, you know. Yeah, no, for sure. Anyway, just there's an there. art form to interpreting the vagaries of planning. <laughs> We're doing getting down to. Calgary on Friday morning is a summon from any person interview on us with just a proposed them all on time. Five now, one now, four and then the back. Oh, that's rough. Did you make it to any of the hockey games too? Yeah, a couple. Yeah. Friday. Oh, sorry. Are you talking about the Oilers? No, no. our company's. Oh, something much more. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, you guys have a much, <laughs> much more entertaining than the Oilers. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> you guys any good? I'm not. <laughs> it's so fun. Damn it. Sounds like. <laughs> Well, the reason I don't go is because the other teams have a bunch of young guys. Who, well, and guys my age, I guess, who are, are good. Mm. When I first came to Canada, I was the skate and the hockey gear on at the same time. On the rank, I didn't get past the, the boards where you come out. And I got a little bit better in my years, but it was almost a joke having me out there. All right, who do I prevent? Here you go. Oh, I'm spelled wrong. <laughs> Hey Kevin, tell everyone why you're why uh, no, this why you have a huge piece of granite. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, in those stone. Um, the company I work for, ISL, partnered with Hapa Collaborative, the landscape architecture firm out of Vancouver. Mm -hmm. We did a plan for the University of Alberta for the eighty third Avenue, and I'm sorry through the middle of. That's hmm. It'll never be implemented, but it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> no, we are overdue for some campus. 
uh, public space improved on smoke. <laughs> Not these days. <laughs> One of my first projects. Oh, it's back in 89. Yeah, the transit. Up there, adds it up, yeah. <laughs> I was a lot of unit paving milk together. By the way, you owe me a lot of I know, I owe you. I told them both to sell you. Yes, she did. Have you been going to any oil states ever? I went to Arizona. Oh, the Arizona game. And no. I haven't been, been to one for like years. That sucks. And, uh, yeah, it sucks. And then the game last night was I guess like we insane. Yeah, uh, yeah, that would have been the one. But I love yeah. the fringe. Oh. Sorry, I totally oh, forgot about those. those. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, That's okay. Oh, Don't worry. I'll just tell like, you. I don't know. I love that arena. Like, it's just, yeah. like, I haven't been to the game since the closet was finished. It's like oh, yeah. the patios and like stuff's happening. I'm like, oh, this kind of feels like. Like a thing, like yeah, it feels yeah, kind of yeah. real, right? Like I remember going to Rexel Place and yeah. <laughs> just comparing that. Just to interrupt for a second, if anybody wants a drink, there's drinks in the fridge. Oh, the kitchen area. Show old I am. The last Oilers game I went to, Wade Rexel got into a fight. <laughs> last last second. <laughs> yeah. Neil Brighton of the Minnesota North Stars. Oh, oh, my oh that is old. That's old. I am old. Yeah, I tell my classes I'm I'm old enough to remember when the weathers were great and the mall was weird. <laughs> they love mall stories. Oh, every Canadian grew up with space on the beach. Yes. Yes. I grew up with rocky old land. So I think there's one. There's one box there for leftovers, but um, mm -hmm. I don't know what we're going to do. Yeah. It is. I used to have a, a Rubbermaid container I brought for this, but I completely forgot. Mm, that's, that's a good idea. Yeah, he's like, he just cut them into bigger pieces. I guess if there's some plates, we can hmm? bury them upstairs. Mm -hmm. It was one of the downsides of meeting in person is dealing with the food. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like you have the. Although I didn't deal with the food this time, so I was of like the leftovers like, and everything. And Dave oh. does. I tell oh, Dave, okay. she just said that I'd get all of us to try the right place. When it was open yeah. City Hall, it was even more I'll, uh, uh, I'll challenging. Let you know as well. Be wrong, but I sense that the deliberations go longer when you're in person. Say that again. The deliberations go longer when you're in person. Yes. I actually enjoy it. Yeah, you know, it's um, it's just your it's expensive parking down below there. Mm -hmm. It helps to get the nuanced facial expressions in the deliberation. <laughs> So do you think we've been 10 minutes? Like, Just about. Okay. You know, I, kind of, I, I think I must have missed the fear. That's the other part. You don't mm -hmm. get the pre-meeting. You feel guilty coming in and making a decision later on. the formal. Do you like the change very much? <laughs> Must be good, everyone's quiet. It's really good. Yeah. 
So I have now finished my update. So tomorrow morning, okay. I will read your notes. All right. And then pop this into your Google form. Since you can't work in Word. No, it's not that I can't work in Word. I know how to use Word. I find that so strange. Like a lot of our proposals, we'll do through a Google Doc yeah. on Teams. Yeah, because we have so many people adding their bits and pieces, especially if it's a multidisciplinary, large size. Yeah, I find some right. It's a little cumbersome and sloppy. Yeah, <laughs> especially if you've got people tracking changes, making comments, blah blah blah. Yeah, I the thing I, I struggle with with Google yeah. is, is like someone makes a comment Bob's and then who's Ballywood? who ultimately has the authority to approve like to approve the comment. From our standpoint, it would be whoever's going to in charge on the yeah. pursuit we, as the project manager. We need so. someone as good as GIS sometimes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then we have like our whole who's marketing out? crew out of Vancouver there. <laughs> and sometimes it's even tough having them involved because yeah. they'll start asking questions or saying, making suggestions. They have no clue what the project's about or why we put something in the context that we did. But this doesn't make sense. Of course, it doesn't make yeah. sense. <laughs> well, that happens here too. Like everybody in the dog gets, you know, wants to get involved and. Yeah. You know, why are you doing this? You lose the <laughs> message, right? Yeah. Well, okay. I like, cleared it. Yeah, just go for wash. All right. International students with more physical. Yeah, Forty-one, Kevin. Forty-one. Yeah. <laughs> not one, two, four. <laughs> he's gonna get. Hang on. He's gonna get. He's gonna go with us. We're a little more of a blurry. Forty-one. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Uh, so uh, uh, we have good math and science. This is this will be like good weight training. <laughs> That's nice. We haven't uh, actually applied for any design works in a long time. I think the last one we got was for immigration hall. There. <laughs> immigration hall over there. <laughs> How long ago was that? That's a while back. Well, that uh, on GIS. When was that? We don't really do much on anything. There's a number of projects we never put in, like at the tower and all that stuff. Also, communication. That actually got all the old technical components. The, you can have so much more valuable your resource with your students because yeah. for them, they don't have anything really. How long have you been with your, your current company? Since, since 2016. Um, oh, okay. And then our previous company had been around for 30 years. Mm. So it was started by with a lot of our partners uh, back in 1985. Okay. So, and then I joined in 90. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's, yeah. So it's, it's, it's been uh, around for quite a while. It's always an awkward, awful thing where I, was, like, I think I think there's so many things Edmonton that have been now for small town for like 34 years. Okay. So I started in Toronto. So I I I, I was uh, a graduate from no, the University of Toronto. Uh, so faculty of architecture and landscape architecture. So, so yeah, when I when I graduated, I I was I had done pretty intense course during the last because that was a five year undergrad, and during my last three years, I I sort of went and worked. For the, oh, I worked for the city of Mississauga one summer. Didn't really like that I mean, too much. Yeah, uh, yeah we, we could move some of our other. And then uh, I worked for uh, we garden, really like really a, a, a garden service. One of those indigenous, uh, super popular. Well, that was a great, but that I made lots of money 
Okay. I was I was working till late all hours of the night, and uh, that was good because yeah, my fourth year I spent seven months in Europe um, on a study abroad, so which was kind of cool. Where in Europe did you go? Uh, well, I'm originally from England, so I spent the first couple of weeks with a couple of my classmates. They joined me, stayed at in-laws and uh, traveled around and then we were in france uh, mainly paris but we did a lot of traveling around paris to all of, of course the famous gardens and went and saw a lot of palladian villas and a lot of uh le corbusier work yeah we went to the um and then, then the majority of the rest of the trip was Italy. So, yeah, all that. When I was in Northern Italy, like it was nice. They sort of structure it so they give you like a, you know, five days off or whatnot. So, I when I was in Northern Italy, I hopped on a train. I went up to Zurich and then went over to Berlin and then came back. So it was it was kind of nice. Yeah, it was good. So. But it's funny, I, I, I came out of school and I ended up at a, uh, an engineering firm, Marshall Macklin Monahan, Triple M. Um, although it was kind of cool because they were doing a lot of really neat work at the time, like both international and local. But now I've come full circle. I went out, blazed my own trail for a while, and then ended up an engineer. You were the man. Because they're oh, Kevin, until they're used and applied. So Is there bread? Have we missed? I don't think so. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, because I'm, I'm trying. You know, I, I bring. I, what I do is I try and pack in. I think we we'll start with the planning structure and get it down to the details as we. Well, I ask you, but I also explain planning. I, I hate. Is coming out saying I'm in the No, I'm not. Just the minute you do that, I never, I don't like the word urban fun. No, I, um, I am surprised we adopted it so broadly as a few people that everybody wants to do it and and i use city planner but then i go i explicitly do city work i mean i yeah. in urban centers i do both. city work you do both uh, there's garlic bread for dessert Ooh, no. actually i forgot the service service. Service. i had a second coffee and now i'm really doing it yeah i, I should sign myself I should. I, I all right folks at home i think we're ready to start again okay so I'm here. All right, but yeah, I've been, I've been, I've been kind of playing around with that. So, so the, the class I was supposed to chat about um, the assignments and actual rezoning application. Uh, Craig, you're there. Did we lose uh, Mindy? Yeah, it looks like uh, Mindy has or has had to jump off. I don't think we're making any more motions, are we? So, no, um, doesn't matter. It's true. Pretty good. What is OSPRS? Strathcona Public Realm Ooh. Strategy. Oh, hmm. You guys will just be chopping at the bell. We have no interest in that. Do you have any interest? <laughs> I have nothing to say. Oh. <laughs> that was on the news actually the other day. Okay. Well, they were just saying about the process they're going through and whatnot. Mm. Yeah. All the decision making that they're trying to make. Yeah. Do we have parking? Do we not have parking? Where do we have parking? Where should we restrict parking? 
Are you just trying to round me up? Okay. <laughs> not, not intentionally. So do you, if you can stop sharing, Ashley, then I will, okay. um, well, I guess I better log into the meeting. All this time I've not even been in there. Actually, it is nice to meet you in person. Yeah, you too. <laughs> Okay, I think okay. Um, Do you have enough uh, strength to carry that home. No, you're going to oh. bring it down for me. They're heavy. I had to carry <laughs> this <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> Even just out to the what back to a car is, is really heavy. <laughs> Pindle stones. Yeah, from Manitoba. It's good, it's good paperweight. <laughs> okay, so the next item is um, really why we're here, which is to uh, <laughs> forget about the other presentation well i mean to physically <laughs> while we're here yes is um oh i wonder if it would hurt, it would help just go back no, i wouldn't have to go back to the agenda uh, basically what we want to do is we want to create some space to talk about um standards and procedures um but but put that in the context of, of what's happening this year in terms of the edc work plan i think everyone's up to speed on it but if not it's a good opportunity to just give you a bit of an overview of that project and, and what's involved so um I have a very short presentation that I'm going to make. Hopefully it won't be too long. And that will um, allow us to uh, have a chat about standards and procedures. Okay, so uh, we're going to talk about uh, a few things here in the next uh, hopefully 10 minutes or so. We're going to talk about um, the, the work program and the schedule and the deliverables around this 2024-25 work plan that Council has approved. We'll talk a bit about the roles and responsibilities, including what you as a committee can do. Uh, I want to talk a little bit in particular about the engagement program that Ashley and I right now are in the midst of put, putting together. Uh, I'll touch briefly on the Council report we have to do, open up to some questions, and then that'll lead into our standards and procedures conversation. So for those of you who just need a refresher, there's three tasks that Urban Planning Committee approved um, the committee to pursue this year. One is to review the standards and procedures that were originally created in 2022. Second was to review the draft principles of urban design that this committee has been working on and David has been tuning up. And three, uh, reviewing the scope of EDC review. And that really includes three things. It includes the, the bylaw itself and some of the language around what projects are reviewed. It includes the geographic boundary, which is also in the bylaw. And it also includes the exemption criteria that were developed in 2022 to just make sure that the right projects are coming before the committee to review. <clears throat> so in terms of the work program, uh, here it is. We're right in, in the midst of project planning, which includes uh, communications planning and engagement planning. Uh, we're going to start the initial engagement phase uh, in the first two weeks of May, and that will run till the end of June. We'll talk about all this in detail in a minute. Uh, we'll develop draft deliverables over the summer. Uh, Mid-October to mid-December is when we'll go back out to our stakeholders to just validate. And then uh, we have Q1 of 2025 to get the work done before the end of this term on April the 30th, 2025. Um, in terms of the deliverables, uh, the city manager, whoever that ends up being, will sign off on the standards, standards and procedures, which will include references to these other, other things. So in terms of roles and responsibilities, so this committee, EDC, you're essentially the project sponsor. Um, you will we'll bring you up to speed on the project on, at key points only, but ultimately you'll be kind of the sign off uh, authority on each of these things. There is an opportunity that's, I think, really important and valuable for people on both the committee and the subcommittee to be involved in engagement. Not to jump ahead too much, but we're going to be doing some focus group or small group conversations that I think having people from EDC involved would be really helpful, not just to hear firsthand what some of the issues are, but to just help in that relationship building with industry. So the subcommittee, which is obviously the level below this table, um, they're actively involved in this work, so they're almost our steering committee, and we've also talked to them, and that includes David and Neil and I, and uh, to see if they also want to be involved in engagement. And then Ashley and I are the project team, and we're doing the day-to-day -day stuff, and we're doing all the internal integration in terms of communications and engagement. 
all that fun stuff. So as I mentioned, um, what we're spending most of our time right now is getting the engagement plan ready so we can go out uh, in the first couple weeks of May. So we know we've got internal stakeholders, so that would be development services, integrated infrastructure services. So obviously we work with them in different ways. David's already spoken about some of the particular challenges with IIS. Um, we haven't given much or any thought about the internal engagement right now, I think because it's subject to a lot less rigor than the external engagement. So we're trying to get the external stuff in place because it takes longer to get all the approvals and mechanisms in, in place. So external stakeholders are the design industry, builders, um, because we have a lot of people coming to EDC that are not architects because of, uh, you know, especially these smaller projects, and of course the development industry. Um, we don't see any public engagement included at all in the project. And uh, we're going to rely on three things, an online survey, one-on-one -on -one interviews, and small group conversations. And everything will be driven through our EDC website. So the kind of questions we're going to be asking, and I think it's important to share this, we shared this with the subcommittee because like these are your questions that we're articulating on your, on your behalf. Uh, and again, not to jump too far ahead, these are not the literal questions, these are topics that our research people are now starting to kind of massage. And the direction from the subcommittee was that we would share the, those questions with the subcommittee, and if time permits, we'll share them with this committee, but it's only if time permits. We're on a very tight timeline. Um, so anyway, there will be like that quality aspect to it with the subcommittee. So in terms of the standards and procedures, uh, we're looking at improvements in some key areas that were that were dealt with in 2022. So submission procedures, scheduling, and just clarity around recommendations. There's more, but you know, those are some of the key things. Um, we wanna know about the experience interacting with the committee, uh, the impact of EDC on project quality. Uh, the principles themselves, again, um, we've been directed by a subcommittee to actually uh, have industry look at the draft principles and in so doing say to us how well have they done the following how well have they aligned with council priorities uh, how well they focused on things like urban design and placemaking site neighborhood context and uh, how well have they done in terms of clarity around expectations um, for what is submitted to review by the committee and the last one again scope of review this is the boundary and the um, uh, the bylaw and the exemptions. Simply put, are the right types of projects and the, and the right types of geographies being reviewed by the committee? And if not, what does that what does that look like? And this one's sort of interesting because we're asking industry to help us from a best practice perspective. Like, yes, nobody wants to come to EDC if they don't have to, but this is about whether as a city building exercise, EDC is ticking the right boxes in terms of doing its job. And as to next point, um, ensuring design quality. So we do have to go back to council. They want us to report back. Uh, we don't know a date um, on the principles. They're not interested in the standards procedures and they're not explicitly interested in the bylaw, although they will have to approve a bylaw change. They would like to know how the principles are going to align with their own priorities. And at Urban Planning Committee, there was talk about things like climate, resilience, mitigation, uh housing and houselessness so what are those what are those big picture opportunities um i think the obvious response is edc can address some of those things and and some of those things edc can't so i have flagged here and we discussed at the subcommittee briefly that there may be an opportunity or even a need for some education with council about you know what exactly urban design is and isn't and what edc can and can't do but urban design review isn't isn't yes urban design can do a lot design review right so there is an opportunity um that i think we should we should look to seize on so that's a quick overview of what we're doing um after a few questions, we'll jump into the standards and procedures, which is one of the three tasks and to get some input and feedback on. Is there anything here or online I can answer with regards to the work plan project in the three tasks? 
I just make sure like uh, Kelsey asked, are you still into uh, doing good excellence in design? Because I'm worried that it's the budget cut there. And the reason I raise it, if the city's not going to leave that, then it's not the standard to go out in the private sector and ask. Yeah, that, and that brings up the question of role. So that's why I raise it. <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, we'd be coming to fun. I mean, we're not approving, but if we're making recommendations and they've got a mandate, well, that's not where they're going then. Just a landscaping day, but I hear that they'll accept trees but no shrubs now. It's the maintenance cost. So I don't know if this is the right time where we'll get into it, but further to that, like are they able to do it? But do they view themselves as leaders and like their projects as exemplars of good design? Like is the city obligated to lead by example? Do they view themselves that way? You don't want me to answer that, do you? <laughs> I think I, really, <laughs> I don't want to give your answer. But it relates to some of those comments that were in the yeah. table. Yeah, it's a challenging, it's a challenging question for sure. And, um, I mean, we're gonna jump into this very yeah. quickly, but are there any other sort of general questions about what we're doing? Um timelines anything of that nature because if not let's do it so just as a um kickoff we did look back in uh 2022 and previous and many of you weren't here then but we did spend two years developing standards and procedures uh, i won't get into detail you can look in, at that if you wish but some of the things we did do is we simplified the submission procedures we streamlined how things were scheduled we spent a lot of time clarifying and improving the function of the committee and the roles of the committee. This is just three items here, but my goodness, it was everything from, you know, how we recruit, how we evaluate, how we onboard, uh, how motions are made, the whole idea of support and non-support. We got rid of walk-ons. Like we just streamlined so much to try to make things better. Um, and then the other thing we did that was really important is we did uh, formalize an exemption process, which has actually stopped a lot of projects from coming to EDC that arguably don't or wouldn't benefit from the review of the committee. Small projects. So there are some things that are still left. Um, even in 2022, we did identify, but we never got to it, is uh, just making sure that informals and formals were were uh, meeting their intended function and even lately i've just observed there's been moments where you know some of the conversations you had about informals and formals are not it's not sticking and um there could be an opportunity to just revisit these things um the other big one which is really apropos based on what two of you have said tonight is in 2022 we talked about how to improve communication with council we never figured out how to do that it's a big question but this might be the time to give that some more some more thought. Um, and then the question of what else is really where we're at. So we've started a document that um, uh, I think I'll just share it. And we're just going to open it up for the rest of the meeting, however long you want to spend on, you know, what what do you find either from a day to day or from a strategic perspective that we can fix in a set of procedures? that we can look at next year. That's as simple and as complicated as the question is. And I know you just ate, but Brownie's already dozing. Um, so full of bread. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I we shouldn't have brought, hello. <laughs> we should not have ordered bread actually. Next time there's no bread. Noted. Um, so yeah, I'm just gonna find it here. Have it somewhere. Sorry, if you, did you did you send us a link to the most current copy of the standards and procedures? I'm pretty sure that you have I it. I can't remember yeah, because it's, um, it's, so many. it's in the spreadsheet. Yeah. Well, I guess you've edited the one that's on. Well, I mean, the problems these days with all these links, it's so it's so hard to keep track of everything that people have. So I've got lots of ideas, but the question is whether they're already covered. Because I think <laughs> <laughs> oh, this was the discussion guide. Yeah. That link. I'm just wondering if there was 
Yeah, there's a link in the beginning of the discussion guide to the. Oh, yes, okay. there is. Yeah. Uh, I'm just going to. Oh, okay. There we go. Thank you. Yeah, and what we did is uh, I just pulled I pulled literally this spreadsheet from 2022, mm -hmm. and just created two new columns and just said it, it, this doesn't all it does is just summarize things. I just did that in in the in the slides presentation. The really key thing here is to is to jump to here and say, you know, here's the list that Ashley and I have started putting together, and this is based on our own conversations and our uh, observations of meetings and hearing from all of you. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's where we're at. We can go through this list. Um, I'd be really happy to just open it up and just have a, you know, a very friendly, free flowing conversation about again, from a day to day point of view, what are the things that that and you folks at home, what what you think we could look at improving? I can start if you want. Please, I'm not trying to, but. This would help when we have when we get sent for a formal that we can get the notes from the informal that we made. Um, just it, it's a lot easier and quicker when you're running around. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it would, I think, be very helpful when you come in. I'm just speaking myself because yeah. I'm running around so much, and then I could quickly look through and see be a bit better prepared. So we were chatting about that. We don't take notes of the yeah. informal, do we? We do. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. Um, for Ambleside, I couldn't. I wasn't here for that one, so I don't know if maybe we were West have some. I couldn't find them in that folder. But okay. um, so that's, yeah, we typically do, so I okay. can share them. It's a small little thing, but it just yeah. can really help them <laughs> so that you can see what you're looking at now, so you can correlate. Um, the other one I I have, which is probably one. I am really curious to know, and we talked about this earlier, uh, as to how, when we make these approvals, or sorry, not approvals, yeah. but scores, yeah. and we have conditions, or when we don't, like, wow, how they take, but is it actually doing anything? Which is my biggest frustration, is how effective are we, is really what I'm getting to, and yeah. I feel we're missing. Because we spend a lot of time as a team, we're, we're putting our volunteer time in, and I just want to know, well, because I don't know how effective it really is. I don't know about how the others feel. Um, I mean, we just all sort of, we got the impression like today, we felt we couldn't really, we had to support it, they were uneasy about it, but it's a bit late. <laughs> so that's the other part that I feel is, uh, so, uh, out of interest, like, do you have any thoughts about how, like, the, if, I don't want to make it about accountability, but just how the effectiveness could be measured or like another feedback loop or something? Like, have you thought about that, Nick? The so the development officer, whoever's doing dealing with the application, yeah, should all they have to do is either send a note. This is how this was taken into account, or. Uh, they could come back and present this is what was taken into account and the decision was made. Yep. That's all it needs, just so we can get some feedback from the people. And I, you know, I appreciate their time, but um, like I said, it could just be a note. These things were taken into account, these weren't, and some why behind it would be nice. Yeah. Um, I mean, we try and give our whys, right, when we're, we're having the debate. But yep. that, I don't know how the rest of the community feels, but I would love to just know, well, How's it? What happened? Because we send out like a letter of recommendations, yeah, yeah. and then it just could they actually respond directly to that letter to the direct recommendations we're making and say we implement this in this way or it's choose to do this. Yeah. Just some, and then it's kind of like feel a little bit that's rewarding a, to yeah. know that it was actually yeah. listened to. Or just that's... drive around, finish projects, and be like, yeah, ah, ah, ah. <laughs> well, that's the other exciting yeah. part is when you get it and you see the project, yeah. and you can go out and go, yeah, we, we made some change here. Yeah. I mean, otherwise, it, to me, I just feel like, you know, we're all committed to what we want to do for the city. But then I ask myself, well, if it's not really been effective, and to support that, I generally believe, I've mentioned to others, that we should be, our processes should be designed with effectiveness in mind. Yeah. Right? So if the effectiveness is, or we create a bunch of recommendations, 
Sometimes they're followed, sometimes they're not. We kind of wash away. Well, then we have to rethink how we do recommendations. I, I, or, or do we even make, uh, I think we do have yeah. But just everything has to be aligned with, well, how do we create a path? Mm -hmm. Value, like that's we're giving our time. I just like looking at projects. I'm okay, but everyone else is giving their time. Oh, we're <laughs> like looking at yeah. wow, time is yeah. my problem. <laughs> but I mean, I, I, I feel frustration. It's like I think a lot of this just goes into the ether and uh, the applicator, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah whatever, <laughs> and, and moves along. You know, I get, I also get frustrated with thinking, you know, I think of like Hall Lane Park when I went through that one, and we're on a river system, you know, and and I know how hard it is around it and not seeing things like low impact. Did it actually happen? I don't know. <laughs> but it'd be sad to hear that it didn't. Folks at home, just jump in or raise your hand if you want to take part yeah, here. Yeah, shut up. No. Yeah, no, it's okay. I wasn't, yeah. wasn't mine. And, and, you know, maybe it not, I, I, I agree with you. Um, the worst version of that, but still okay, I think is, is having meetings with the development officers. Like, what, what's useful to you? What, you know, how can we add value? Uh, I agree. I'd love to uh, see it on a project by project. Like, what was taking into account? What was it? But or, or why? Why was yeah. it not? You know, it might be money. Okay, well, yeah. just yeah. so we can get some feedback. It mm -hmm. helps us. Do so. Private development projects go through development officers for formals. Do do development officers have much sway on city projects? I'm going to say no, but I don't know. I don't know the answer because it's really a zoning. Yeah. Right. Exactly. There, it's Cindy Lee is here looking at it from a zoning perspective. And how often are our comments related to adherence to the bylaw? No. Exactly. And I'd argue, I believe they shouldn't be. No. Not my job. Yeah. To to. Um, to police the zoning bylaw. Yeah, yeah. I'm that's not, that's the job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's right. 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 Table speaks for getting here. Yeah. yeah. Unless the specific comments about like yeah. blazing transparency, right. articulation. Or we are like, looking to vary yeah. X. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. What, what do you think of yeah. the implications yeah. of, of that? Right. That, I think that's useful. But whether they have enough shrubs or not. Yeah. yeah. Or, yeah, yeah. Blazing, you know, meet the zoning bylaw. Is the use correct? That's. Yeah. yeah, you're right. Design related adherence to the bylaws, you know, in a hurry. But and in fairness, I find that I find development officers are really interesting. <laughs> um, the they have a lot of power through the legislation than most in, in some areas. But the other part is, like, we've all got different backgrounds and disciplines. So we're bringing a whole lot to the table. <laughs> But what is the uh, knowledge level of the person you're actually speaking to? I'm not trying to say that, in, but experience and knowledge around urban design or it is an element of understanding from us the why, if that makes sense. I'm trying to put that in a delicate way. <laughs> I'm not trying to demean anybody, but we've got people who are experienced in their yep. fields. That, that's why we're here to bring advice, try to help them. Because again, make the decisions. That's where it might be. Well, what's this? One? Why are we doing this? I don't know how to get that across. So I'm just raising it. Okay, uh, yeah. So that's well, what I was going to ask you. How do you do that? Um, I'll just volunteer time for a bit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a good question. I need some time to think about it. I think that there's always a way of sharing the experience. Um, to some degree, it might be just being in person here. With the committee on occasions, so it might yeah. be sharing some ideas where we have, like what we're doing here, but having development officers a session with them to help them get ideas and ask questions of us and having that type of thing. Hey, I'm just throwing that out there as an idea. It's, it's sort of a, yeah, it's you know, I think high level, or, but I kind of believe it's like we, we don't necessarily have a lot of impact on yeah. we, this project needs to have this, but having ha, like having a deal or whoever in the room or in our virtual room as part of the conversation, right, is part of a collective collaborative. I can hear and listen, hear, listen take things into account, 
push back ideally, right? We, we run very formally. Yeah. I question that, but that's the best way to do it. Right. right. You get your you get your you get yours. And then we're always like, yeah, we the best stuff is actually the conversations around that. Right. It should be designed in a way to have more conversation. So I heard that went after um because the whole issue of being in camera. Yeah. So I've talked to Paul and a lot of reasons people left this because we're all in the profession. We're all relying on the comments, and so you don't want to use the expression piss yeah. off yeah. someone who's like, yeah, you did this. Or it's, when it's you're older, really, I don't care so much. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that helps when you have, yeah, older zero Fs folks. Um, but when you are on, I mean, there are, you know, I'm sure developers are watching to look at what's going on in a committee yeah. and seeing how we interact. And so everybody's going to be conscious of it. It's, rec it's recorded as well. I always, go, access yeah. The yeah. Files. I always go back to, I, from a planning side, like my job isn't to police designers, it's to help designers with client, right? So it's like, I trust Adam to do a fantastic architectural building, right? But how can I help her that she can go to her client? Go, yeah, we really have to do this, Chris, right? Like, yeah, trust me. Right? I, I used to see it when we did, you know, my prior panel, we were all in person, uh, back in those in-person days, you would see it sometimes, you would sign a project and the designer's like, yeah, right. So I'm like, sometimes you have to, you know, wait down hard, uh, come down hard on, on a project. How is it done in a way that helps? Yeah, um, the and I have heard that as well, where some architects have been appreciative where their clients have ever asked. Yeah, so yeah. having us that like, thank you. <laughs> so part of that comes back to clear principles, which are you know, yeah. in better shape now. Um, so it's like, yeah, these and and you know, to the degree that again they have weight. Yeah, we got to do this. We we got to do better attend, you know, a better treatment on the public. Um, and just to add one other thing on procedure, which occurred with me, which I was not very happy with, um, was one of the applicants I met at our professional conference oh, yeah. and ripped into me. Right. And I'd like to have a better procedure around that because um, it was from a one in our professional ethic that should never happen. <laughs> I actually challenged them afterwards to see you should not. Like, literally, she was like I introduced you and suddenly I didn't think it's all and she just started pointing a finger at me and telling me what how could I talk about a wonderful building like this and mm. blah 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 and so I think there needs to be some procedure for all of us that that we are respectful of applicants um because I honestly think and this is person who's well known in the city the city should have done something personally because I, you know, I spend a lot of time, but to be abused in person in front of other people for a comment that I made on a committee about your building. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think that should, I don't know what others think, but I, that's the first time I've ever had that in my career. Um, yeah. Someone be very rude. Is anybody else's thought on that? I'm just interested to hear feedback if I'm out to lunch here. That I've never come across it. All my times, it's never also never happened to me. Although I think that person was also be lagging for me, and then somebody else got like I know who you're talking about. Yeah, so, that was at the same uh, event. I you. wonder if it's a complaint to like the AAA instead of the city of like who, yeah. the, whoever the yeah. regulatory I, I body is. I just don't know. What well, there should be two city. things. I would think that as like you, you are on a city committee, right? Yeah. You're on a committee of council, so yeah. there should be some some expectations around being a committee member and what you are, you know, what what you should be expected and not expected to put up with. Like, so I think there's that side, but then I think you're right. There is the other side of there it. There is the professional. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but what? Like a harassment kind of both. In a way, yeah. right? Like but, it's but, a, but it's, it's almost like harassment. outside agent. Like what authority does a city have over that person to intervene yeah. and do anything? I don't know if there's a... Yeah, I think the professional association would be more. I well, I don't know. A, a more a joint. To me, people like I don't tolerate that type of behavior. I think it's inappropriate. You have a conversation, but don't start accusing and making accusations. To me, it would be a letter, sort of pointing out to the person their actions and just giving them a heads up because you shouldn't tolerate that. And it's like you know, this is a professional. You know, I, I don't expect that from professionals. Um, 
And, you know, there's no like, I simply fronted her and told her it was inappropriate. And she did apologize, but um, it caught me completely off guard because I've never had a bit of Yeah, no, it would be off putting for sure. Um, and I just don't think it's acceptable. You guys have some professional respect whether, um, you know, we put our time in, we're just providing our input. I don't think those things are justified, but that's my opinion. Yeah. Well, it's on the list. I think fundamentally it's how can we be more effective? Yeah. That's the big question. Our recommendations don't have a lot of clout. Like there's nothing, no recourse for not adhering or not following our recommendations. It is an advisory committee, so there's. Yeah. 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 Which all, every design review in North yeah. America pretty much is. Yeah. yeah. I struggle with that because we come here and we, you know, it's a bit of a checkboxing exercise, I think, for a lot of projects to come through here. <laughs> yeah, I know. I sort of like, it's like, like, you don't, I don't want that. Uh, I tend to believe that at the minimum of having to check that box forces a little bit at the minimum <laughs> of uh, consideration. Like, how have we addressed this? What's our design rationale? What are we thinking? Oh, some of those questions, those are, I totally disagree with them, but at least they had to think about them for a few minutes. Yeah. Um, there's value to that, obviously, would be valued way more. Yeah. It would be interesting, actually, going back to the development officers to get them to actually share with us how have they received our comments. How, yeah. how is that, yeah. you know, is it just like that? But it'd just be interesting how, what could we do better in the way in which we lay out recommendations? I think the development officer and the, sorry not to harp on it, but for city projects, the city, the project manager needs to respond to how yeah. comments were responded to. It, it, yeah, exactly. Um, the, the problem with the DO is going to be they're already just stressed to the limit. Or, I mean, it doesn't mean it can't, it can't pursue it, but that might be a challenge for the project team. Absolutely. There should be some feedback to say thank you, and here's what we did or didn't do. Yeah. And what and the why? Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I think having maybe a touch point like we did um, earlier in the year with development officers is a a good way of just sort of sharing thoughts and and um, um, feedback to one another uh, to get a sense. But I think to ask them to provide feedback on every project that we provided commentary on is maybe a little too much. Yeah. And and I, I think the biggest problem I find with city jobs, and I don't see much value in going to the PM because I think that's probably the crux of many of the issues that we have mm -hmm. in see, reviewing city projects is the PM that's running them um, and their inability to think along, uh, think in the way of design process, the way we're we're all thinking together and providing feedback on. So it's like who um, would it be then? Yeah, I'm not too sure. Like the thing, the thing that always uh, I come back to is that we, you know we this committee was initially established by council. So you know, really, ultimately, it, it is. It's to, it, you know it goes back to council to see to talk about the effectiveness of this committee, but you know I think we also have a bit of an issue there because I don't think that most of the council members really know what this committee does. So, um, so I think that, and I I know that that was touched upon in the previous iteration of this, is that there needs to be a better some better communication and connectivity between this this committee and council so so um, so they can see the value in this committee and they can provide some feedback as to um you know how effective we're being and we can share in some of our opinions with regards to you know some of our opinions be them positive or negative with regards to Private development projects coming in, and then city-led projects are coming in, because as I said, ultimately we are their um, committee. 
So there's four ways that this committee can interact with council. And unfortunately, it's not necessarily a two, two-way street. So one is for a rezoning application, the, the letter gets typically appended to administration. Well, not in the past, that's the one area that we've actually had the biggest impact yeah, on. That's right. Like some of the huge rezonings that came mm -hmm. through this committee when when, when I first started, mm -hmm. like that's where it has direct impact because yeah. our recommendation if we say no, a motion of non-support yeah. then that zoning doesn't get passed so so that has you know that is actually a huge yeah. Yeah. Well, that's number one impact number two is there is a counselor that is that sits on this committee uh counselor aaron pat is on this committee and he has attended a number of meetings but you know, it's a busy guy, and he's not able to maybe give it the time he he would like to. Um, but that that's a method of connection. Um, we do prepare an annual report every year. The last one was just submitted and approved about a month and a half ago. I think I don't say unfortunately or fortunately, but that has not been a vehicle that's been used to communicate. It's not that it's trying to paint a rosy picture. It's a very much a matter of fact, like. Here's how many projects we reviewed. Here's how many got support. Here's our membership. We have succession issues. Like it's very logistical and not strategic. And maybe that's something that we can look to do, especially listening to the conversation to say about this Ambleside project. And then the fourth is this council luncheon that we have tentatively booked for June. The, the issue there that we've learned is that, again, that has to be very one way. It has to be you communicating to council. There can't be any conversation or decision made at a meeting like that because it becomes a council decision and then there's quorum and all this other stuff it's <laughs> it's <laughs> it is what it is Just but it's a great opportunity though to share you know observations of how the year has gone and what some of these these um you know repeating issues are that you that you see points of friction right points well, of friction of that is on excellence and why like ideally it's a conversation right like yeah. where are the trade-offs there's always a trade-off like oh, yeah. pure uh, but where on the spectrum are we aiming for just just going back to the zoning one so basically we get dcs coming in dc ones and dc twos yeah we don't you don't see rezoning to standard zones anymore and i believe that when eventually i know they're going to get rid of they want to get away from dcs that's the theory, but there's a there's a um, there's possibility of that. Mission. That's right. Yeah, there's a there's a, a contrary belief that DCs will continue and maybe even in, increase. Yeah, no, I'm probably of a different sort of opinion on that one. I think uh, as a planner, <laughs> uh, if we take like you know the bucket of rezonings, a good chunk of them can go to standard zones. Those with decline. But still, the larger, weirder, complex projects that won't fit. Yeah, yeah I think which are the most relevant to us. So. Yeah. I, well, I think you know, what I was getting to is: should we be looking at more when there is structure plans, which yeah. to me are like mass plans, come in and they have design standards right. around them? To me, that should. I don't know if that yeah. comes in, but that's more relevant. A direct control is. Almost too late in the game. Well, the DCs are used way too much here, and they have they've, they've created a whole lot of other problems, like from a planning point of view, that limits the ability of doing that award. And I see that the way the planning is going to go forward is you're going to get more master planning coming in. You're going to get use of using GIS and design base elements. Uh, and so all I'm saying is it may be better that we got all of those types of things coming in that are related to design because they have those elements then and I'll leave DCs sure when they come in the DC one and two but I think eventually they're going to in my opinion though just going to fade out or be less not more but that's my opinion so not being a planner I'll maybe rely on the planners to tell me this um I won't talk about area structure plans but for master plans it, it's fine and dandy that you want to see them, but isn't isn't the rezoning the kind of trigger that brings a master plan in the door? The, um, the but if the rezoning has 
So the rezoning would be based on the zone. So the other part then is looking at the zone and whether it has design standards in it, which sometimes they do, right? Um, <clears throat> but it wouldn't be, so it's going to, usually you'll get a master plan that fits with the districts that you're going to zone yeah. into. And so sometimes they'll put in, and it's depending on how the structure is done between the master plan and the zone. But you will probably find that some of the, it's either built into the policy of the master plan, that's a subset to the district or the zone, or it's into the zone. I guess the way I should have asked this, sorry, was what is the approval trigger for a master plan? Yeah, that was my question. Joe, developers just not going to walk in with a master plan just for the sake of sharing it with. Yeah, so the trigger is going to be through the policy. So you'll probably get that through these new district plans that are coming out that you're going to end up with. It, well, what I call an area structure plan is yeah. probably what they're going to end up doing. But area structure plan has a component of master planning to it. So high level of well it, it's so i've done area structure plans where you put design standards into it yeah yeah and and that's not uncommon and it's an opportunity for truly getting good design by incorporating that into policy because the next level down is where the triggers happen so that's why i said it's important yeah because yeah no I you, you're getting if you miss that because it's a higher statutory document planning is a layer of cakes and and so an area structure plan is above your yeah, land use bylaw and everything else. Mm -hmm. Land use bylaw is just a tool, and it's one of the tools to implement it. Yeah. But it doesn't overrule your area structure plan, right? And it goes all the way up to your area redevelopment plan, plan, which is perhaps not more relevant. Well, area yeah, same thing, same same thing, thing. Thing. area redevelopment yeah. plan. Any of those to me, like we did. I'll give you an example. <clears throat> so we did on One Eleventh Street. Gosh, uh, and 124th Street, we did a amendment to the zone and there was an overlay on the design elements. So that, and it was based on the, I think, the C, so the old district C8 or whatever it is. Um, and it had mass, but the problem was the building mass was way too high. Yeah. And I agreed with the planners, the design was poor. So we actually changed that district. They were so happy with us because we changed it to improve the design so that you didn't get a mass building like what you get um, on um, oh, Jasper Ave going down towards, was it the building? It's just this big block mass. But see, so right. the change we did to the district was based on design principles. So it is important to me because there's an overlay that happens, which is at the pedestrian level. So it's all about veranda, street frontage, all that. These are all design elements. So that's where I guess I struggle because to me, that's important. So I'm just throwing that out there in terms of understanding. I actually think we're too late <laughs> when we get to this level. How many, like, how many plan? How, how often does plan amendment come into this? Plan amendments? Um, <clears throat> well, they come in. I'm putting a plan amendment in soon to about three districts, three different statutory plans. Um, it's an industrial area though, so it's a little bit different, but. Plan amendments certainly come in. And so if you have this in the process, if they did plan amendments, it would come through. That's, yeah, that's the trigger. Mm -hmm. But I don't know how common. The plan amendment but then I'm a planner, so I'm looking at that scale. Very, without a plan amendment, it's a project that fits within the policy of the plan. But if you think, let's say someone decided to challenge or appeal, if, it, if it's consistent with the plan above, yeah. then they're going to win. Yeah. So. Yeah, you, I mean, you do a plan amendment because you want to go higher to answer. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm going to ask another dumb question because I'm not a planner. Uh -huh. um, the argument with standard rezoning is that there, there's really nothing that the city gets from an applicant in terms of like design. It's it's an envelope, right? With with a plan amendment, what? Sorry, I should know this. What does the city ask for in terms of a deliverable that this committee could? meaningfully comment on. So if there's a plan amendment that's relating to design, that's really what you want to focus on. So if it relates to the streetscape, if it relates to, for example, they want to do a plan amendment to change how, you know, like you might have a policy around um, the floor to ceiling height at the yeah. ground level. Um, 
it could also have, you know, I've seen area structure plans that talk about the glass facade of what should be along there. The, the zone, all, all the district does is allows, when you assess it, it's really saying once you get zoned that, they can do anything that's in that zone. Mm -hmm. But the other statutory document that's above it is the one they have to align with as well. Thank you. So I'm thinking of a project that we saw, and I always remember it. Uh, I've used it in my class. <laughs> right? It was a project that there's a DC, they're switching the DCs, and it didn't fit the ARP. Mm -hmm. Right, and it was like, well, this doesn't fit the ARP. But yeah, but there's already an existing DC that doesn't fit the ARP, and so it went forward as a rezoning, and we're considering as a rezoning. Like, there was no plan amendment, even though it didn't fit the plan. Right, and plans are, you know, they're kind of loose, and no one really calls you on it if you don't play it, you know, so, by the book. But I'm like, that should have been a plan amendment. So regardless I'll, of how supportable, I'll, I'll give you an example. The Sturgeon Valley that we worked on, area structure plan, huge freaking area, yep. high level area structure plan. It requires a neighborhood area structure plan. Then it needs a conceptual plan when they do that, because conceptual plans, when you're getting down to very detailed on the basic is for subdivision. And how we structure it was because this is going to be so long, rather than setting up design standards and the developers complaining, we set up criteria around what we expect to be achieved because of the density on design. They create the design standards that the municipality assesses, and if they accept them, they then become a statutory part of the document. And they weren't permitted. So it's just understanding how those tools work. And, and we're talking densities here of uh, 30 dwelling units per net residential, 42, 40. That's not, you know. So what would the deliverable, in that case though, Nick, what would what would the deliverable be that the committee reviewed? Well, you'd be reviewing, like I said, and in, in, well, for that area structure by itself, but where it would be is at the level where those designs are coming in, where the developer is presenting, here's our design standards, then the committee would look at to see if it meets the criteria. I'm just using this as an yeah, example. Yeah. Well, in my mind, design standards and master plans are two different things. Like to me, a master plan is a, is a visual artifact yeah, uh, yeah, you know, so you can get so you're going to get that happening. <laughs> yeah, uh, you're going because of the densities we're, that we're getting now. Um, it's going to go the area structure plans are all going to be more of a massing. Um, and we did do massing. So when we write some of these, we actually give massing visuals and diagrams right. and showing how it all works. It's then what is the cookie over the top of that extra detail? But it's important because it, it's about how it functions with its public space. And we, we wrote policy at the ASP about this because when you get to that sort of density, you've got to make sure that there's a good interface between the public and private realm. But is there enough detail present to really evaluate design? Because so, guidelines are, are one thing and they're often quite open-ended right to allow flexibility in design to how you accomplish the principles established in the guidelines but so i know and then people come and reverse engineer their decisions yeah. to say oh we adhered to this yeah open-ended ish so all guidelines. i'm saying is i'm not saying that's the end of it you should still get the dp when it comes in so that you're evaluating against those design standards but if you were at the front end and having an influence on the design standards mm -hmm. then it's better than suddenly you get the application. It's like, oh, these are the design standards you're looking at. You're like, well, yeah. Are yeah. Do you have it? So I, all I'm trying to do is, uh, yeah, with, uh, with my prior UDP. So we see it at rezoning, and the rezoning is meant to be general, right? Because it's like, oh, you're you're changing density, you're changing height, whatever. How are you addressing that? Now, of course. Give an architect a building, they're going to figure out floor plans. Show an architect the floor plans and a comment on floor plans. Like, oh, it's interesting. <laughs> That's the idea, right? It's meant to be general. Um, and then there's the DP where, like, did you deliver on that? And you're just starting to look at your planting palette and your material treatments. And you shouldn't be doing that at a rezone. No, so when you rezone, when I rezone, in fact, I've gone to court on this once several times because a municipality has requested all this information on design. What type of building are you going to have? And I'm like, this is misleading to the public. Yeah. Because when you rezone, I can do any of these uses, and as long as I meet them, that's corporate. So by putting a building in front for a public process or what might be, 
is actually misleading because once it's zoned, I can do any of these and I can mislead you. And you're paying, then someone's paying all this cost to do something that's frivolous, really, and it's misleading. And so you should be assessing and rezoning purely on what are the uses, what are the potential impacts, what is the form of mass in mind, right? That's the purpose of a whole zone. Sub subset to a zone, you can have separate to a zone is then design standards. Or you could have them built into the district, or you could have them in your area structure plan. So I'm trying to get to where the sources come from within mm. that planning structure. Was EDC ever envisaged as like reviewing planning documents? I don't know. I wasn't around when it was envisaged, but um, no, generally, generally in my time, both as here and as a committee member, that's not what we looked at. Which surprises me. It yeah. Does. It's a yeah, yeah, yeah. As a planner, I had to go to design panel to on a plan, on a high level plan. Yeah. And what I'm trying to get to is we've got new things. The whole planning structure is planned. Land use file is completely changed. Yeah. District plans coming in in June. I know that because the, you've got the city plan, um, and underneath these, you're going to get uh, neighborhood renewal plans, area redevelopment plans, whatever you want to call them. And they're at the level where design principles come into play. And with the densities we have, that's where it's going to hit. So that's why I think it's so important. And what needs to happen is the planners should be extrapolating those key design elements for the committee to the group. Or the policy, because it may trade. Yeah. Which is more urban design. And you, you want the check of the details? Yeah. But they're almost, and I'm not as a planner, that, I'm like, that's the yeah. that level. I'm not trying to take away the, yeah. the detail. No, no, no. I'm but the problem is that when, we, when we, we get the ones that are really detailed, yeah, it's intuitive to, to, to look at details. Yeah. Right? Go, well, what about this, you know, this alignment of this pathway? And we didn't really take on yeah. the big one. So you want both, right? You want a high level intervention. You want well, what the, the, the other thing that's yeah. important when you do that area structure plan or the whatever level we talk about, it's not just the private site, it's actually dealing with what the design of the public realm is going to look like. And so, yeah, absolutely. And so the, this is where I feel there's a gap. We're just looking at the building and, okay, what's around it? But at this level, we're actually looking at it for more well. Let's go. Sorry, I apologize. Very much. Um, okay, then we're going to have a problem then because we're not, we're going to. Oh, I think it's gone too. Hmm? Gone too. Oh, well, oh, then our meeting's, our meeting's done then. But I, I said, I can't think it, does, it doesn't matter. No, it does. We have to have quorum to have a meeting. Well, it's all right. We'll a few minutes. No, it's okay. It's if if Ty's gone. Well, it's, Ty's gone. This yeah. Also. Okay. Um, okay. Well, then what I'm going to suggest then is um, we have a document. I think the thing to do is to you all have it. Um, just find my see my pants here. Yeah. Put your comments in. We can also do maybe just some quick like one-on-ones, like you've got a lot to share. I'd love to know more because I'm struggling with this committee reviewing principles because <laughs> I just don't think that's what this committee is meant to do, but I'd love to talk more about it. So maybe we can do some one-on-ones. Maybe um, uh, you can put comments in here um, and then we'll just keep, keep moving along. This is not the first time we're going to do one of these, but over the next year, we're going to have to do a, a fair bit of these. Yeah. You have check one on ones in your engagement plan. <coughs> uh, external, yes. Yeah, but I mean, yeah, internal. internal. We haven't developed it yet, so yeah. I think it's going to be way more fluid. The internal stuff. Yeah. So I'm not. I'm not as worried about it. Yeah. Do you guys have to submit a formal engagement plan to bonds or whoever? Oh yeah. <laughs> it's taken. It's taken four weeks, and it's going to take another two weeks, and it's only six weeks. <laughs> You're doing a good job. <laughs> Yeah. They count classes. On that. I've never actually counted the time, but on a plan, I feel 78% of my time is spent on engagement. Yeah. On the plan, the preparing, the writing, the doing it, the, comedy, the reviewing it, the, the documenting it. Right. You're, oh, yeah. you're fine. I'm, well, I'm good here. How much I'm good here. Like, oh, okay. Oh, okay. Uh, and I have no comments. All right. Awesome. You guys say it. Uh, I think in public, it's. it's Double that. Uh, unfortunately, that pay for double that. No, 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 no. In, on the public side, uh, right where we can, you know, we're not billing yeah. hours in oh. that way. Yeah, it's yeah. even more. Anyway, sorry, I go on. I, I should hmm? give a yeah a little 
Like, who stops for me? Let's go. Yeah, it's a, I, 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 it feels to me in the sea, there's, there's a, this giant gap, right? A, 